بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم السلام عليكم peace upon you all I welcome uh, let's let's give another rousing hand to Pastor McBride for that very penetrating talk I, I want to reiterate briefly everything he said, uh, but I don't want to repeat it uh, by emphasizing some of the points that he so articulately emphasized and illustrated. So I want to uh, move away from the systemic per se, away from the obvious injustices of a state which from its inception has been defined by white supremacy uh, and move towards uh, the old time religion, if you will. Not the old time religion of fire and brimstone, not the old time religion that many people see as being overly judgmental, but the old time religion that emphasizes to us that there is something beyond this material world that there are spiritual realities that are more real than what we can empirically verify and which we can immediately witness. And I think it's very important for us to periodically remind ourselves of this because the injustices of our world are becoming so great, so pressing, and so dangerous if they re remain unresolved that they can sometimes involve us to such an extent that we forget about that other realm and we forget that perfect justice, infinite justice, immeasurable justice only exists in that realm and not in this one. So I think this is very important. Now, what I'd like to contribute to this conversation are, are some of the things that I've taught and teach, uh, predominantly African-American congregations of Muslims, not exclusively, because most mosques find people of every stripe, every background, and ours in New Haven, Connecticut, Masjid al-Islam, and in Oakland, California, the Lighthouse Mosque, are no different in that regard. But I've had to bury people that were shot by cops, young African-American Muslims. We've had to bury people, young men, who were shot by their peers. So I know the reality and the pain and have seen the, the social implications, how they affect families. I've visited not so much these days, but in the past on a regular basis, predominantly young men, African-American men who've been shipped away to these gulags of prisons and seeing the impact of that on their lives and on the lives of their families. And I don't know if Pastor McBride had the new Jim Crow on that reading list, it probably was, so to emphasize, read that book and read all the other ones from James, James Cone, uh, The Lynching Tree on down the list, to begin to try to understand the implication of these policies on the lives, not just of those who are immediately affected, but on their families and their neighborhoods and communities all across this country. Justice is one of the great human virtues. Aristotle mentioned the four cardinal virtues of justice and wisdom, temperance, and courage. And in the Muslim tradition, Imam Ghazali brought those into Muslim orthodoxy in terms of character reformation and uh, character cultivation. Al hikmah, wisdom. Shaja'a, courage, ifa, temperance, adl, justice. And these are all terms and concepts that we find in the Quran. But justice isn't always immediate. 
We were just reminded that from the very beginning, the inception of this country, the Constitution relegated African people of African descent to being three-fifths of a human being for constitutional rep representation. Zero percent in terms of actually participating in the political system. Civil War, once again, showed that justice was not forthcoming. And as a result of that, a war was fought, fought that nearly destroyed the country. A devastating war, which war fought today based on the current population of the nation, upwards to 30 million people would perish. That was followed by Jim Crow. Jim Crow coming in at the time that W.E.B. Du Bois, Du Bois, mentioned that the, 20th, the problem of the 20th century would be the problem of the color line, indicating justice still had not come. Brown versus the Board of Education, justice still had not come, or we wouldn't have needed that decision. Rosa Parks and Dr. King and the rest, and then a new generation, Stokely Carmichael, H. Rapp Brown, Eldridge Cleaver, Bobby Seale, Huey Newton. Justice still had not come. And now we have the Black Lives Movement, which tells us what? Justice still has not come. So what do we do? While we're fighting for justice, we have to understand that we don't need anyone external from ourselves to tell us that our lives matter. Our lives matter because we've all been given a basic fundamental dignity, human dignity, human worth and value from God. And as we said yesterday, if you're right with God, you're right. And if some racist doesn't think you're right, that's their problem, not your problem. And their problem definitely has implications in this world, and we struggle to fix it. But while we're fix it, fixing it, we understand our lives matter. Our lives matter if they matter to each other. If my, ma my life matters to my spouse, or my children, or my neighbors, or my relatives, then that's an affirmation that tells me something that those uh, porter, sleeping porter car workers, maids, men and women affirmed, I am somebody. I am somebody. Something that those garbage workers in Memphis and Tennessee affirmed, I am somebody. And something that those young people are standing up all over this country are affirming, I am somebody. But I am somebody. We're at the festivals of faith because God made me somebody. I am somebody because when I go to the family reunion, and I have one in Atlanta, Georgia this summer, looking forward to it. I have nephews and nieces, cousins and aunts and uncles, Unfortunately, no grandparents left who affirmed to me that I am somebody. And we have to cherish that. We have to nurture that. We have to, to, we have to build on that foundation, brothers and sisters, as we go forth to do that difficult work, that work that doesn't always involve immediate gratification to change the systems and the power relationships of the world. We can never forget what gave black life meaning in the first place. Black life meant something in slavery. And because it meant something, slaves were able to laugh and to love and to value the family that they might have only been able to enjoy temporarily before the wife or the children were sold off or the husband, but they had that ability to be human. That wicked system could not take their humanity away. 
as the time runs down, we're here in Louisville, Kentucky. Yesterday the day we mentioned this is Muhammad Ali's city. And when they chronicled Ali's life in a movie, The Greatest, <clears throat> a lot of us don't remember this or that scene from the movie, but we remember George Benson when he sang that song. I believe that children are the future. Y'all yeah. thinking about Whitney Houston. <laughs> and George said, the part that brought the tears to our eyes, no matter what they take from me, they can't take away my dignity. Dignity cannot be taken, it can only be forfeited. We have to remind ourselves that we're not giving our dignity away and you can't take it. You can take my, an equal education from me for now. I'm going to straighten that out eventually. You can take away decent housing. You can stop and frisk me disproportionately and throw me in jail. Take away my freedom, but you can't take my dignity. And you can't buy it because it's not for sale. In conclusion, there is an Arab uh, proverb. It goes something like this, فَاقِدُ شَيْءٍ لَا يُعْطِي Someone lacking something can't give it to others. There are indeed systems of oppression, there are institutions, oppressive institutions, but they're manned by individuals. And as long as those individuals are racist, as long as those individuals are ignorant, as long as those inf in individuals have no compassion, the institution isn't going to change. So amongst the work we have is a massive educational pro uh, project to educate those individuals, to educate those individuals, and to educate our children because eventually, those racists are going to die. It's up to us collectively as a society to determine, will their children be just as racist as they are? Or will their children, when their children are manning the offices of power, will they be just? Will they be equitable? Will they be fair-minded? Will they look at a person and judge him and her based on the content of their character, not based on the color of their skin? What we do today and what we do tomorrow in terms of educating our nation will determine how long we have to wait before we can see the justice that's long overdue. Salaam alaikum.